Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Tonight, from Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark cards bring you a true story from the life of Bernard Baruch on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. And here's our distinguished host, Mr. Lionel Barrymore. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Hallmark Hall of Fame. Tonight, we're going to tell you a dramatic incident from the life of America's distinguished elder statesman, Bernard M. Baruch. In his career, Mr. Baruch has performed services for no less than seven of our presidents, services which can only be described as unique in the annals of American history. But in tonight's episode, which is one of the most remarkable incidents ever recorded, you will see Mr. Baruch in still another role. Now here is Frank Goss. When you want to remember your friends, there's one way to be sure the card you send receives an extra welcome. Look for that identifying hallmark on the back when you select it. For words to express your feelings and designs to express your good taste, let the hallmark on the back be your guide. For that hallmark tells your friends you cared enough to send the very best. Lionel Barrymore appears by arrangement with metro goldwyn Mayer who celebrate their 30th anniversary at your favorite theater with The Long, Long Trailer, starring Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz. And now Mr. Barrymore brings you tonight's exciting story on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. about to tell you is true. It actually took place in Paris 28 years ago. Then as now, the name of Bernard Baruch was internationally famous. His work for President Woodrow Wilson during World War I was legend. Therefore, his appearance at the Paris Railroad Station was reason enough for reporters to be on hand. Monsieur Baruch! Yes? I am Jean Pantage, International Press. Welcome to Paris, monsieur. Well, thank you, Mr. Pantage. And may I present my friend, Monsieur Kennedy. White Plains, New York, Mr. Baruch, United Press. Glad to meet you, gentlemen. We'd like an interview. Excuse me, Mr. Baruch. Oh, Lacey? May I have the luggage checks, please? Yes. Here you are, Lacey. I'll meet you out front, all right? That'll be fine, sir. Lacey can claim luggage quicker than any man I've ever seen in a Paris railroad station. Been with me for years. Are you in Paris to see someone in particular, Mr. Baruch? No, no, I'm here to see Paris. I try to get here once a year if I possibly can. Monsieur will certainly visit Monsieur Clemenceau while he's here. If I see Mr. Clemenceau, it will be just a social call, nothing more. I always enjoy visiting him. He has the most wonderful cook. Are you on a presidential mission? There's been... No, no, nothing like that. This is just a vacation. I'm a private citizen. I want to rest and see the sights of Paris again. And it's good to be here. (laughs) Mr. Baruch, the cab is ready. Monsieur Baruch, fine. And would you care to go up to your suite immediately? No, I don't think so. Lacey can go on up with the luggage. I think I'll stretch my legs around Paris for a few minutes. As you wish, of course. Potter! I won't be more than 15 minutes. All right, Mr. Baruch. Uh, Monsieur Baruch, suite. Uh, pardon, monsieur. This is the clerk. Who is calling, please? Oh, just a moment. Uh, Monsieur Baruch? Yes? What is it? A gentleman who says he's acquainted with you. He has called several times wondering if you had checked in. Oh, what's his name? Monsieur Reswick. Uh, Monsieur William Reswick. Reswick? I thought he was still in Russia. Uh, do you wish to speak to him? Yes, yes. Uh, you may take the house phone, monsieur, uh, over there. Thank you. Hello? Hello, Mr. Barrow. 
I heard you were coming to Paris, and I didn't want to miss you. How are you? I'm fine, Bill. How are you? Good, Mr. Perot. Well, Bill, we'll have to see each other. I thought you were lost forever in Russia. I'm here on a special assignment, Mr. Baruch, to see you. To see me? What about? Russia. Well, I don't think I understand, Bill. Who sent you? Well, I'll uh, tell you when I see you. I'd rather not discuss it on the phone. Oh, sounds secret and important. Yes, it is. Could we uh, meet this evening, Mr. Baruch? Of course, Bill, of course. Uh, how about my room, say, 7.30? I'll be there, Mr. Baruch. More coffee, Mr. Baruch? No, thanks. Bill? No, no, thank you. I'll be in the next room if you need me, sir. Fine. Ah, wonderful dinner. A lot better than we're getting in Russia these days. Well, there's hardly an American reporter anywhere who knows more about the Soviets than you do. I've been in on some pretty big things there, Mr. Baruch. I've had a front row seat. And I've had a chance to get to know the inner circle. Trotsky, Rykov, Stalin. Stalin, huh? He's pretty powerful there now, isn't he? What kind of a man is he? Well, what kind of men are any of them, Mr. Baruch? I can tell you this, Stalin's making his job the key job in all Russia. He's got his eye on the very top, and it won't be good if he gets there. Yes, so I've heard. I've followed events there with keen interest. I've been increasingly depressed by the dictatorship and the terrorism those men used to stay in office. Secret police, Oge Payu, and all that. Well, now, what is this secret mission of yours? Premier Rykov sends his felicitations to you, Mr. Baruch. I suppose that's the best way for me to tell you why I've been sent here to see you. Premier Rykov asked you to see me? Yes, he asked me to request you to meet with Leonid Krasin. Do you know Krasin? Oh, I've heard the name, yes. Is he in the Russian embassy office here? Yes, Leonid Krasin is ambassador to France. He's one of their top economic experts. Mr. Baruch, he's very anxious to see you. Well, what does the Russian ambassador want to see me about? He'll have to tell you that himself, Mr. Baruch. Bill, I'm not connected with the United States government, but I am an American citizen. Like the old Romans, that's my proudest boast. The United States has not recognized Soviet Russia, and even though I'm a private citizen, it, it would be impossible for me to visit Mr. Krasin at the Russian embassy. I quite agree. But will you meet him somewhere else? He won't come here for fear of publicity. Now, I can arrange a private meeting elsewhere if you're agreeable. All right. From the little you've told me, I am interested in seeing what is on Mr. Krasin's mind. However, it must be strictly understood that I meet him as a private citizen. Can you tell him that? I'll tell him that, Mr. Baru. All right. Thank you, and good night, Mr. Baru. Good night, Bill. Has Mr. Reswick left, Mr. Baruch? Hmm? Oh, yes. Yes, just left. Well, he didn't stay very long, Mr. Baruch. Lacey. Yes, sir? Our stay in Paris may turn out to be something more than just a vacation. In just a moment, we return to the second act of the Hallmark Hall of Fame. This is the time of year when people slump in their chairs and mutter, I don't know what's the matter with me, I just feel low. Well, actually, there are good reasons for that midwinter low. Too many days without sunshine, income tax time, and the long spell without holidays. And I can't think of a better time to send your friends Hallmark cards. For Hallmark cards aren't made just for the holidays and big days of the year. On the little everyday days of work and routine, Hallmark cards are welcomed and needed even more. Think of what a lift it gives you to receive a card from a friend unexpectedly. There are Hallmark friendship cards that just say, Hi, I've been thinking of you. They're designed with such warmth and gaiety that they bring a heart full of cheer. 
And what about a Hallmark cheer-up card for a friend with a cold? She's not really sick, of course, but feeling droopy and depressed. Your Hallmark card will make her feel very special because you thought of her. So tomorrow, visit one of the fine stores that features Hallmark cards. You'll find so many cards that bring sunshine into dull days. And the Hallmark and Crown on the back carry the brightening message that you care enough to send the very best. And now, Lionel Barrymore brings you the second act of our true story from the life of Bernard Baruch. son of a country doctor, Simon Baruch. His ride to success was rapid. His ability to get the facts, all the facts, became legend. But perhaps all of these attributes were never more clearly brought into focus than that day in Paris in 1926 when he received the second phone call from reporter William Reswick. Hello, Mr. Baruch. Are you still willing to meet Mr. Cresson? I'll still meet him under the terms I described to you, as a private citizen outside of the Russian embassy. Did you tell him that? I explained all of that to him, Mr. Baruch. He understands your position perfectly. He is willing to meet you under those terms. Now, can you make it tomorrow afternoon? Yes, I think so. I've arranged a meeting place in Versailles. Both of you will be my guests. The address is 15 Rue Gabriel. 15 Rue Gabriel. I've rented a suite there. I'll tell Mr. Crasson you'll meet him then, say, uh, 2 o'clock. All right, 2 o'clock, 15 Rue Gabriel, Versailles. Suppose I pick you up. Fine, Mr. Baruch. Mr. Crasson wants you to know how very much he appreciates this. <laughs> Good afternoon, Mr. Baruch. Thank you for coming. I'm Leonid Krasin. How do you do, Ambassador? Now that you gentlemen have met, perhaps you'd like lunch. I had it sent up. Thank you, Mr. Reswick. That sounds fine, Bill. We are meeting somewhat informally, Mr. Baruch, so you will forgive me if I do not observe the amenities connected with my position. Of course. Please, sit down. Thank you. Ah. What is on your mind? <laughs> that is a popular American expression, is it not? <laughs> we seem to use it all the time now that you mention it, yes. Yes, it, it is applicable here as I wish to explain to you what is on my mind. Uh, would you care for some salt? Oh, thank you. Go on, Mr. Krasin. Uh, the Soviet government is very much aware of your services to your own government during the last great war. You proved yourself a master in mobilizing industry and economy. Mr. Baruch, my government faces the problems of a similar mobilization. Excuse me. Mm. However, our problems are even more complex than those you faced. We must not only mobilize our industry, we must first create it. We must not only reform our economy, we must first bring it to life. We must lift ourselves out of the inefficiency, the poverty, ignorance, which is our heritage from the Tsars. I uh, am aware of conditions in Russia, Mr. Ambassador, and I don't think they have improved much since the revolution. No, no, Mr. Baruch, they have not. What little industry we had has been destroyed or made useless. We find ourselves without mining, without railroads, shipping, utilities, dams, power plants, many, many industries that are vital if the Soviet state is to succeed and achieve its ultimate goal. Yes, certainly. And uh, what do you propose to do? To put it blunt, my government has commissioned me to place all of these projects in your hands. The office would entail your personal administration of Russian economy and industry. Uh, now, Mr. Baruch, my government is prepared to invite Western businessmen to the Soviet Union for the purpose of developing our resources and promoting our economy. Now, in exchange, 
We will grant them generous concessions to run for any number of years. Concessions which will assure them the most handsome profit. Mr. Baruch, I, I don't have to tell you how vast this project is. Russia's economic potential is untouched. Yes, but what is it you want of me? You would organize and build a great new Russian industrial state. Mr. Baruch, we want you to do for the Soviet Union in peace what you did for America in war. This is... This is very flattering, Mr. Ambassador, but we have agreed to speak frankly here. Oh, yeah, of course, Mr. Baruch, of course. I am not a communist, Mr. Ambassador. Huh? I do not believe in the communistic system of government. I'm opposed to totalitarianism or, or police systems. Hey, I, I know this, Mr. Baruch. We all know it. Well, then it seems incongruous to me, Mr. Ambassador, that you people would come to me and ask me to do no, this. No, 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 not at all, Mr. Baruch. And there are other considerations which I shall come to in a moment. But be assured that you, you are precisely the man we seek. No, we are realistic in the Soviet Union, Mr. Baruch. We are facing the facts, and the facts are that we lack capital. And, and even more important, what the American press calls know-how. Well, I... I still can't quite reconcile it, Mr. Ambassador. Mm. Mr. Baruch, we recognize our need at this time is for a man of your capabilities. We feel that certain overwhelming problems exist in the Soviet Union that you are capable of solving. We admit this to you in making this offer, you see. The techniques of capitalism will achieve the desired ends for us, and therefore we are broad-minded. <laughs> Never heard that of the Kremlin. <laughs> but we are, we are. We will take help from any source. Um, Mr. Baruch, may I ask, you were not compensated for your services to your government during the war? No. Nothing? No, of course not, not a cent. A lot of men work for my government for nothing when there's an emergency, Mr. Ambassador. Mm. Other men make far more than financial sacrifices. Uh, well... We do not expect you to make even financial sacrifices in our emergency, Mr. Baruch. If you will come to Russia, we are prepared to meet any demands you make. You may have any part of the concessions that we will grant. There is no fixed price for this position, Mr. Baruch. Instead, you may take every profit you wish. The amount then of your personal gain will be something that I would not uh, attempt to calculate. So, that is our proposition, Mr. Baruch. Well, that's very attractive, Mr. Ambassador. It's very attractive indeed. I don't believe I've ever had so tempting an offer. It is indicative, Mr. Baruch, of the regard placed on your knowledge. Now, let me understand all this clearly, Mr. Ambassador. No. What you are proposing is that I come to Russia and build a finished industrial system. Is that right? Uh, precisely, Mr. Baruch. It is imperative that we have such immediately. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mr. Ambassador, do you know anything about American history? American history? Yes, Mr. Baruch. I have studied American history. Well, then you know, Mr. Ambassador, that even a casual glance will show the one truth that it has taken a whole century for America to build her industrial mm -hmm. system. Mm -hmm. But there is no reason for fumbling in the Soviet Union. The resources are all there. We have labor ready to work. Resources? Labor, Mr. Ambassador? What you're asking is not for one man to accomplish overnight. It's a job that takes generations and a great number of men. Uh -huh. Mr. Ambassador, you haven't mentioned the real needs of your government. But I have just mentioned those needs, Mr. Baruch. They are most excruciating. But, Mr. Ambassador, huh? you have mentioned nothing about the needs of people, only the needs of government. I am speaking for the government, Mr. Baruch. And I am speaking of government, Mr. Ambassador. Government is the people. Huh? Mr. Ambassador, don't you realize the gigantic burden you will be placing on your already overburdened people if you require them to build this modern industrial state? while they're still scarred by war and revolution and decades of poverty. 
And their needs come first, Mr. Ambassador. You can't ask a man to build a factory before he builds a home for his family. You can't ask a man to, to dig a mine before he feeds his children. The real need in your country, as I see it, Mr. Ambassador, is to first raise the living standards of all your people. Mm. You have not mentioned my offer, Mr. Baruch. I feel your proposition is, is most generous. But I make a counter-proposition. I will come to Russia if you will permit me to do first things first. That is, to meet the critical needs of the people before anything else. I would concentrate first on agriculture, housing, clothing, public health, and education. And then transportation, to make your people and your economy mobile. Now later, when things have improved, you can turn to this heavy industry you're so concerned with. But Mr. Baruch, now let me finish. When, oh, I would Baruch. come to Russia. Hmm? I would come to Russia and undertake this task on two conditions. First, I come without compensation and pay my own expenses. Well, it's most unusual. And second? The Soviet government must abolish terror and tyranny. Are you speaking of the police system? I'm speaking of all the apparatus of unrestrained power and repression, Mr. Ambassador. I'm speaking of everything that makes men slaves. We cannot build anything that will last under such conditions. A man must be able to walk upright and free. I came here to speak of industry. The, the intangibles of freedom, Mr. Ambassador, are more important than the tangibles of coal mines. A free man, a happy man, a warm, unhungry man does not want to wage war. Your proposal is final? Yes. Those are the conditions under which I will come to Russia. Well? I shall convey your views to my government. I cannot say what their reaction will be, but... Frankly, Mr. Baruch, I do not believe that your proposal can be accepted. I will not be surprised, Mr. Ambassador, if it is not accepted. No. 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 Uh -huh. Well, Mr. Baruch, I must go. Uh -huh. Mr. Baruch, we are for the moment two men meeting in a hotel room, huh? Yes. And then speaking for myself as a man... I wish you to know that you have given me added reason to respect and admire you. Your offer is much more generous than the offer we have made to you. If my government does not accept it, I hope we will yet find a way to open the door to freedom in my country. I hope so. Good day, Mr. Baruch. Good day, Mr. Ambassador. Gentlemen, the true story you've just heard does not appear in most history books. However, recently the reporter, William Reswick, gave a factual account in his book, I Dreamt for Revolution. The Hallmark Hall of Fame is proud to have brought you this remarkable story because we feel it demonstrates not only the strength of Bernard Baruch, a man who could turn aside unlimited fortune in the interests of freedom but also the strength of the democracy he serves. Recently, Mr. Baruch consented to state his philosophy in a broadcast, For This I Believe. And here is Mr. Baruch himself in a portion of his recorded statement. I do not believe in utopias. Paradise is not for this world. All men cannot be masters, but none need to be a slave. Evil will invade some men's hearts, and tolerance will twist some men's minds. But decency is a far more common human attribute, and it can be made to prevail in our daily lives. The 
other night, I was at a going-away party for a friend, and every time she was handed a beautifully wrapped present, she'd exclaim, Oh, this is almost too pretty to open. And she'd look at it from every angle and seem to get as much pleasure from the wrappings as the gift. Of course, I recognized the many Hallmark gift wraps, and I kept thinking how vividly the wrappings reflect the extra thoughtfulness and good taste of the giver. There were stunning, unusual patterns by Hallmark artists who specialize in modern designs and colors. Uh, one I remember, a charcoal gray etched in bronze tones. Another, uh, a pink brown and beige medallion pattern like a modern print. And then there were some exquisite pastels, bluebells sparkling with dewdrops or nosegays of violets framed with gold like old-fashioned valentines. And of course, all Hallmark gift papers have matching tags, seals, and ribbons to complete the ensemble perfectly. You'll find Hallmark gift wraps for every special occasion and for every type of person. Each paper created with the careful artistry that means Hallmark. So look for gift wrappings with the familiar Hallmark and crown, the symbol that says, you care enough to send the very best. And now here again is Lionel Barrymore. Well, uh, just uh, as you said, Frank, gift wrappings are important. They're on display at all times. In fact, uh, at a gift-giving party, I'll bet most of the guests would look at the wrapped gifts longer than they do the gifts themselves. <laughs> so, your suggestion to make gifts more beautiful with a hallmark gift wrap seems to me an excellent one, Frank. Yeah. Now, why don't you tell the folks what story we're having next week on the Hallmark Hall of Fame? Next week, Mr. Barrymore, we will present a dramatic episode from the life of the famous nurse Edith Cavill. And we're proud to have the distinguished American artist, Miss Helen Hayes, in the starring role. Oh, well, Frank, well, that sounds like a very special broadcast indeed. <laughs> Until next week, then, this is Lionel Barrymore saying good night. important announcement from the makers of Hallmark Cards. Boys and girls of high school age can win big cash prizes for themselves and for their schools in the Hallmark Hall of Fame contest. All you do is nominate a person for the Hallmark Hall of Fame and tell, in a brief essay, why you chose that person. See the February 3rd issues of Scholastic Magazines for full details on the rules and cash prizes for the Hallmark Hall of Fame contest. Look for Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Our producer-director is William Prue. Our script tonight by E. Jack Newman. Barney Phillips was heard as Bernard Baruch. Also featured in our cast were John Hoyt, John Daner, Byron Kane, Larry Thor, Alastair Duncan, and Vic Perrin. You are also invited to the Hallmark Hall of Fame on television every Sunday. This is Frank Goss saying goodnight to you until next week at this same time when we'll present the story of Nurse Edith Cavill starring Miss Helen Hayes on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. This is the CBS Radio Network. This is KMBC, Kansas City, Missouri.